Welcome attendees to our 10 Rape Myths and Media Research Study Report presentation. I'm Dr. Caroline Heldman. I'm the Executive Director of the Representation Project. If you're not familiar with our work, the Representation Project was founded by Jennifer Siebel Newsom over a decade ago uh, to follow up on the impact of the success of her first film, Misrepresentation. We are an intersectional gender justice organization and we are pushing lots of different levers, whether it's research or filmmaking or hashtag uh, social justice campaigns. Um, we push for better representation across the board in all forms of media. And I am excited today to present um, some kind of shocking research on the coverage of uh, 10 common rape myths in media. This is a quantitative study and we will put, uh, we will share the link with you to the report. The report is hot off the presses just released today. So let me uh, introduce Rebecca Cooper who will be sharing the data from the report uh, just for a few minutes and then we'll jump into our esteemed panel. So let me tell you about Rebecca Cooper, Director of Research at the Representation Project. She has worked as a professional researcher for over a decade and is passionate about data science because she's a nerd like <laughs> most people are. Uh, Rebecca previously worked as the Senior Project Manager for the Gina Davis Institute on Gender and Media. Shout out to the Gina Davis Institute. And also as a state class anchor for Agenda for Children in New Orleans, Louisiana. Uh, Rebecca also served as director of the Lower Ninth Ward Living Museum, a neighborhood museum and oral history archive that was uh, founded post Katrina, as well as working as a researcher for the Mossville Oral History Project at Louisiana. Louisiana State University uh, and also T. Harry Williams Center for Oral History. Her research has been featured in the Oxford University Press Oral History Re Review and the Contemporary Justice Review. And Becca also serves as a board member on the Tech Center, the first civil rights museum in New Orleans. So Becca, take it away with the research findings. Thank you for that introduction. Um, we're so excited to share this report with y'all. Real quick before we start, um, obviously this this report, these findings, and the panel to follow are going to involve themes of sexual violence. So I just wanted to let everybody know, um, you know, an activation warning. Um, and this will be recorded and we will put it up online. So if you'd rather hop off watching it live and then watch it when it's recorded and when you can pause and take care of yourself, please do that. Um, so let's get into the research. So a quick overview of the project. So this report is the first quantitative assessment of the most common rape myths in entertainment media. So we looked at the top criminal justice related broadcast in cable television, streaming television and films. And, you know, just in general, just to summarize our main findings, we found that the most watched entertainment media perpetuates rape myths. It promotes inf misinformation about the criminal justice system and it upholds rape culture in the US. So just before we start on the findings, what is a rape myth? So most of you, you know, probably have heard of rape myth before, but just to clarify, a rape myth is a widely held misconception about sexual violence that perpe perpetuates harmful stereotypes about survivors. It promotes victim blaming and or minimizes the seriousness of rape. So we have 10 rape myths that we found um, being perpetuated in media. I'm gonna take you through each of them one by one, starting with our first, which is, the myth that most survivors report their rape. So we know in the US that only uh, one in three, so 34% of rape survivors report their rape to authorities. Um, and in the real world, the REEL world um, is of TV and cinema, two thirds report their rape. Um, and you might think, you know, is it a big problem that we're showing people reporting their rape um, on TV? And, you know, it is complicated, but at the end of the day, it, it, it sort of sets this expectation in this norm that survivors do report and makes it even harder for survivors who don't report, which is the majority of survivors, to be believed and, and kind of navigate the extra stigma that comes with um, the whole process when you're expected to report your rape if it's real. Our second myth is the myth that survivors report their rape immediately. So we know um, that most survivors wait sometimes years to report the rape due to fears of stigma and retaliation. And again, that's if they're reporting their rape at all. But when it comes to TV and film, over 50% report within 48 hours. So there, we're seeing on TV that rapes happen, people are reporting and they're reporting right away. And again, this is a problem because it establishes this norm that this is how it works. 
So if a survivor isn't reporting right away, that means that they're not really a survivor or their um, legitimacy is called into question. Our third rate myth is the myth of the sympathetic law enforcement officer. So in reality, in the real world, virtually every survivor report who reports experiences some level of betrayal and re-traumatization from law enforcement. And we know this from um, you know, many survivor testimonies that have been shared and also research to back it up. When we look at TV, we measured for whether or not survivors are believed by law enforcement and whether or not they're re-traumatized by law enforcement. So overwhelmingly, almost 90% of survivors when they report are believed implicitly by law enforcement in film and TV. And only 3.3% are shown being re-traumatized. Now this is our ideal world, right? We want this um, to be the case in the real world, but the harm again is that it sends this message that to survivors first off that they will be believed if they report. Um, and it also sends a message to society more broadly that the criminal justice system works when we all know that it doesn't work, right? And we'll get to this more in a second, but in the real world, less than 1% of, um, of rape reports end with uh, somebody spending a day in jail. So it, it, just a little bit of evidence to show that this is not a system that's working. Our fourth rate myth is the one that survivors remember all of the details and often they're expected to be remembered in chronological order too. We know that memory um, issues are really common when it comes to people experiencing PTSD and that most survivors don't recall all of the details. On TV, 94.6%, sorry, this is TV and film, are shown remembering their assault. The myth that false rape reports are common, we've all heard this one, right? Like not believing survivors implicitly because um, there, we all, there's this idea in rape culture that um, false reporting is common. So in the real world, less than 2.5%, and that's a generous stat there too, of rape reports are confirmed to be false. Um, in TV, 4.8%, which is still double the real world. And then in film, one in every four rape reports are shown to be false or um, called into question throughout the time and media. So again, perpetuating this idea that survivors are not trustworthy and that it is common for rapes to be reported um, inaccurately. Our sixth myth is the myth is the myth, myth that survivors are asking for it. And this is one that we've all probably heard of before. Um, the idea that somebody can be asking for rape or sexual violence by the clothing they're wearing, um, by their the, how much alcohol um, they are consuming. And so we looked at both of those um, both of those variables. So when it comes to shown in revealing clothing, this is during the incident. So 15.8% of rape survivors were shown in revealing clothing while they were being, um, while the sexual violence was occurring and almost 20%, one in five were shown under the influence. Um, again, this is just a, a harmful, this subtle message coming from media perpetuates this harmful myth that it's possible for survivors to be asking for it and in air quotes, um, and that, you know, they're to blame for this happening to them, which we know is not the case. The myth that the sh that stranger rape is common. Um, in the real world, three quarters of three quarters of rapes that happen in sexual violence are from a known perpetrator. So this, you know, the idea that all rape is happening in an alley um, with somebody they've never met before um, is just not the case. In the, the TV and cinema world, almost half of the rape and sexual violence is being shown perpetrated by um, a stranger and the other half, you know, 42.5% 40 shown by someone they know. Uh, again, this just makes it harder for survivors to navigate the stigma in the real world, the idea understanding that rape can happen by somebody that's close to us, that it's more likely to happen by a friend or a family member or somebody that's known. Uh, it's really important that we're telling accurate stories when it comes to this in media. All right. My side deck is lagging. Let's see. There we go. Um, the myth that sex workers are to blame for their rape. We saw that sex workers are treated really poorly when they're survivors in film and, and TV. Um, and obviously sex workers have the same rights as everyone else when it comes to con consent and sex, right? Um, consent applies no matter what, no matter what your career is. Um, in, the, in film and TV, sex workers were twice as likely than other survivors to be blamed for their assault. And so that's by law enforcement, by family members and friends, um, just generally giving the, sending the message to us all that, uh, you know, sex workers are less trustworthy and that when they are raped and sexually assaulted, that's okay. The myth that rape kits are tested immediately. So in the United States, 
we ha- this was shocking to learn for, for me particularly. All of this is shocking, but just the idea that there are 400,000 rape kits awa- awaiting testing. So the reality is that we have a huge backlog of rape kits. When they are administer- administered, they're not being tested right away. And we also don't know, um, you know, that's just the data we have available to us. It might be way more than that, but we know there is an issue with those being used in ways that help survivors. And on TV, we see that 82% of the rape kits are tested immediately. Um, so we we are sending a message again through media that this is a normal part of the process and we can expect for the rape kits to be tested and we can expect for them to be used to have a higher rate of conviction, which leads us to our very last myth the myth of high convictions, um, high conviction rates for rape. So again, I mentioned earlier that less than 1% of rape rapists see a day in jail. Um, and on TV and, and in film, um, almost 30% of the rape reports end with a guilty conviction. And we see somebody being actually t- held accountable for this crime. Um, and, you know, it might be cathartic to, you know, certainly sometimes cathartic to watch high rates of conviction on TV and to see justice occurring. But again, it sends this message that the criminal justice system handles um, rape and sexual violence cases and um, survivors a lot better than it actually does. You know, if media were more honest about how this criminal justice system works, there'd be a lot more public awareness about how broken it is. And it would be easier for us to address the, you know, the, the portions of it that really seriously need addressing. Um, and so I'm gonna stop that right there. Let me sh- stop sharing my screen. All right. So thank you all. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions about the research, but for now, I would really like to introduce you to our fabulous panelists and get some questions going. We are really lucky today to have three panelists that are super activists, um, doctors, and just all around incredible women. And I'm really honored to be interviewing you today. I'm gonna start out with their bios for you. So first we have Dr. Patricia Esparza who is the Director of Compliance for a healthcare nonprofit in California. She's a clinical psychologist and former assistant professor and deputy head of psychology at Webster University in Geneva, Switzerland. She was a consultant for the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse of the World Health Organization. Patricia grew up in rural Mexico in Santa Ana, California and attended Phillips Exeter Academy and graduated from Pomona College. She earned a master's and a doctorate degree in clinical psychology from DePaul University in Chicago and she has been a survivor activist for over a decade. So welcome, Patricia. Thank you for being here. Um, And another friend of the org, Dr. Nicole Haggard, who is the director of the Center for the Advancement of Women at Mount St. Mary's University in Los Angeles. She is also an award-winning instructor, TEDx speaker, and published researcher with over 20 years of study contextualizing the intersection of race and gender in American culture. In 2018, she co-founded the Center for Intersectional Media and Entertainment, AKA CME, and an organization, which is an organization dedicated to unpacking why entertainment media matters and advancing representation. Representation. So thank you, Dr. Haggard, for being here. And lastly, our beloved executive director, Dr. Heldman, who is a political scientist at Occidental College in Los Angeles. She is also our executive director of the Representation Project and a political commentator for Spectrum News and CNN. Dr. Heldman earned her PhD from Rutgers University and a certificate in executive leadership from the Harvard Business School. She has published eight books on politics and gender justice, and her work has been featured in numerous documentaries, including Misrepresentation and the Mask You Live In. She co-founded the New Orleans Women's Shelter, the Lower Ninth Ward Living Museum, and Rape on Campus, Faculty Against Rape, and led the, the effort to overturn the time limit on prosecuting rape in California. She is the board president of the TEP Center, the first civil rights museum in New Orleans, and the chair of the Board of Alturas Institute, which is a nonprofit fighting for a stronger democracy. So thank you, Caroline, for being here. Thank you, all of you. What an honor to be with a panel of three women with the word doctor before their names. It's great to be with all of you. Um, So my first question is for you, Dr. Heldman. So the research I just presented shows that entertainment media plays an important role in shaping and perpetuating rape culture. So my question is, can you please tell us more about rape culture and the history of perpetuating it in um, entertainment media? Yeah, thank you for that incredible introduction, Becca, and also for the great presentation, very clear presentation of the data. I know 10 rape myths is a lot, uh, but for folks who've been in this space, um, this is nothing new, right? And in fact, if you've never thought about it before, you probably 
harbored a lot of these rape myths um, prior to, to seeing the data. Um, so rape culture uh, is defined in a lot of different ways, but the way I think about rape culture is a culture that permits rape to happen, mm -hmm. a culture that doesn't take it seriously as a crime, um, a culture that doesn't hold people accountable when they engage uh, in sexual violence. And, uh, and I think the stat, you know, the, the fewer than 1% will ever see a day inside a jail cell is proof enough to me that we live in a rape culture. But also there are elements of rape culture that go beyond just permission and kind of allowing it to happen. And those ele the, the element would be almost a celebration of it, right? Or using it as a plot device or using it as a joke. And so in, in our report, we dive deep into how pornography is promoting rape culture um, through you know the fact that 88 percent of um, the most consumed pornography uh, has some form of violence so we are sexualizing violence against women we're making that normal and of course pornography is is the biggest sex educator of our young people and has been now for two generations uh, we also looked at how classic films have all sorts of either direct explicit sort of rape content or rapey content from, uh, you know, uh, Rocky and Adriana and, and Rocky uh, to uh, the violations taking place in all of these films we consider to be classics, right? Like 16 Candles. And, and the thing is, is I, I love media and I watch all of it and then I'm always angry. It doesn't matter what it is, right? I'm going to see a thing. There's going to be like some representation of, of gender or race or ability or sexuality or age, or I mean, we're going to run into ageism or homophobia or something's going to be there. But for rape culture, it's so obvious. So for example, Jake, right, in 16 Candles, his girlfriend, Caroline, throughout the, the film, uh, we all love this film, probably you've seen it a few times. Uh, he is making comments about how he could be with her, but he doesn't want to be with her anymore. She drinks too much. And he is, he puts her in the car with a young man he knows is going to rape her near the end of the film. And I, one of the things that the artist Dana Title, we've worked with her on a number of events, she brings up is uh, there's this theme that women, when we, when we introduce violence and sexual violence um, with women, they're supposed to either be neutral in the face of that violence in pornography, for example, or they're supposed to um, embrace the violence and, and treat it as though it's welcome and that they're happy about it. And so you see this a lot in porn, but you also see it in 16 Candles, where Caroline like wakes up out of her drunken stupor, sees this guy who, you know, this this underclass person who's going to rape her uh, inevitably and says, oh, who are you? Oh, I love you and goes back to sleep, giving her permission to do so. So we see it in pornography. We see it in classic films. We see it in television. Um, we see it in stand up comedy where rapes are commonly punchlines. And of course, in the report, we, we point out that there are a couple of, um, you know, feminists like Hannah Gadsby, for example, feminist comedians um, who are really, uh, current, Esposito is doing the same thing. They're really using rape to kind of push the envelope and be critical about it. But by and large, I mean, we're looking at like, you know, Bill Cosby with 64 public survivors. He had the Spanish fly bit in his routine for decades where he's laughing about raping women, like drugging and women and raping them. So it's, and nobody said anything, right? I mean, for decades, decades upon decades, and it wasn't just him. Um, you know, it's across the board where you see these rape jokes um, happening. And then of course we dive into like popular music, right? We, we look at, at all genres. We look at country music, we look at pop, we look at rap and hip hop, we look at metal, we look at hard rock and across the board, there are these explicitly rape, rapey lyrics. So I know this is a long response, but a rape culture is where you don't take it seriously, but it's also mm. where you celebrate it every day in your popular entertainment. Wow. Yes. Thank you for that. And especially now we're at the time of year where we hear baby, it's cold outside all the time. Mm. And just it's just everywhere. It's everywhere. Um, which brings me to my next question, which is for you, Dr. Haggard. So I know your research primarily focuses on the impact of media re representation. So can you tell us more about why rape myths in particular and other forms of misinformation about um, how rape works in the real world? Why does that matter? What's the impact of that? Yeah, I think it's so layered, just like Dr. Hellman was saying. I mean, we know that that media has a profound impact on who we know, who we are as people, but also how we view who other people are. Um, and as 
it's it's almost like on both sides, right? Like we're talking a lot about like the people who who are who are committing these acts of violence, but then also the people who are receiving them as well. And what does that communicate to us about how we should operate in a culture with these myths happening, right? Like how are we all operating in this culture where we those lines are so blurred? Going back to that Robin Thicke song, right, where it's literally like the lines are blurred. No, the lines are not blurred. The lines are very clear. And how then are we operating in a culture that that feels like if you say no, it doesn't mean no, right? And I think that that is one of the things that I see in the media constantly that I can no longer unsee are these scenes of people who are starting to flirt and get to know each other and they're in a bar and she'll say something very clear like, I am not going to have sex with you. And then it will cut to the very next scene and they're in bed together. Um, or they'll say, no, 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 we're not going to do this. And it's a joke as if they are going to do it. And so I think on a lot of levels, it has this impact of communicating to us about what we can expect um, when it comes to how we're interacting with each other. And then also what, like you were saying, what we can, what can we expect from law enforcement? So it's really like this constant circle of these ideas that aren't in reality of when it happens to you in your real life, right? And, and what does that look like? And I think that's the disconnect that I see a lot of times for my students who are facing these issues. It's like, what they thought was real isn't real. And that's to me the the problem with this. Yeah. Yeah. Well put. Thank you for answering that. And Patricia, from a psych psychology perspective, whoo, that was a mouthful. From a psychology perspective, can you talk to us about the effects that these have on the emotional life of survivors and how internalizing these rape myths might impact survivors? Thank you, Becca. Uh, that's a really good question. I, I love how your panels always incorporate all of the dimensions of a survivor's experience, and um, I'm happy to talk about that. We know that uh, bringing out a private trauma into the public sphere is very scary, right? It is It exposes you to um, people's judgment, people's thinking, perceptions, beliefs. Um, and we know that female rape survivors who are listened to and are believed tend to have fewer difficulties. It's not that their struggles are less, but they actually are able to cope with the aftermath of what happened to them. Um, and we know through research that if you are among a group of peers who accept rape, me rape myths, that you are less likely to divulge more details and you are less likely to even disclose. Um, and so we also know that if you are among a peers who accept those rape myths, that you are actually more likely to experience post-traumatic symptoms. And why is this the case? Uh, trauma is a disease of disconnection. And these rape myths create a culture, either with your friends, with your family, with your community, that essentially disconnects you from them. It disconnects you internally because you are internalizing these victim blaming uh, rape myths, right? Oh, if it, I must have done something to bring this upon myself. Um, so it di disconnects you from yourself, from your core, from your belief, from your sense of self, your sense of self-worth. And these rape myths disconnect you from your peers. If you are likely to believe that they believe this rape myths, that you are not going to disclose, you're going to have greater traumatic symptoms, post-traumatic symptoms, you are less likely to feel connected to your family, friends, and community. And so essentially, this traumatic event as a disease of disconnection keeps you from being able to heal as you're bringing out your private trauma into the public sphere. And we do know that victim blame and rape myths in particular for a survivor can create a cycle of guilt and shame. And this in turn can actually create a barrier for you to be able to, to heal from the professional help that you might be receiving, or even from the support that you're receiving from, from your friends, family, and your community. Wow, yeah, so it's impacting every state step of the process. And it really puts into context the data that we do have about how, you know, how prevalent rape and sexual violence is, knowing how many people aren't divulging details and aren't sharing and aren't reporting due to the stigma too. Um, Caroline, uh, Dr. Heldman, please tell us, I know that we know obviously that this is a problem in with media, um, but when it comes to other institutions and other, um, you know, you know, other, other institutions in society like law enforcement or the legal system and the political system, how do those systems have rape myths and how are those making it difficult for survivors to get justice? 
Well, rape myths permeate how we view survivors. And as, as Dr. Haggard pointed out, you know, it's, it, it and, and Dr. Esparza, it, it influences how we see ourselves if we're survivors of sexual violence and also how we view other folks and, and then that third layer of how they might be viewing us. And it becomes incredibly uh, important when you're interacting with law enforcement, right? So the first thing is, so the, the law enforcement fails survivors. You uh, go to law enforcement and I, anyone I've worked with, the you know, hundreds of survivors over the years um, will come to me having watched Law and Order and they think it's gonna go a certain way. And this is why these rape myths are so important. It doesn't go that way at all. Invariably, um, they're going to, I've, I've had, you know, they're going to encounter a system that doesn't consider them to be worthy of um, justice or telling the truth. Um, they're gonna, going to face skepticism. Um, you know, they're going to face uh, police officers, for example, who say, well, why are you here? Well, she's here to report a felony crime after she shared her story about what happened to her. I mean, just a complete dismissal from complete dismissal to being told that you're you're lying. Um, the recent documentary Victim Suspect goes into how law enforcement officials who want to cut corners and don't want to spend time on an investigation want to close a case. So sometimes they just go and they arrest the person who's come forward with a claim of rape even though there's evidence that rape happened. They claim that, um, you know, they don't do an investigation, they close the case, and then they they prosecute women who come forward. Um, it's, a, it's a chilling documentary uh, on, on Netflix if you haven't seen it. Um, they're probably, uh, so if you do get to a detective, they're probably also going to treat you with skepticism. And then they're probably not going to send you along to a prosecutor. So of the, the folks who come forward, right, only 5.7% are, are sent to uh, a prosecutor for consideration whether or not it's gonna go to trial. So you're probably not gonna get a trial even if you have plenty of evidence. And the reason being that um, prosecutors are very concerned about their win-loss ratio. That's how they advance in their career. And so if you, and this is where the rubber meets the road with these rape myths, if you have a jury that is steeped in rape myths, even if you know that she's got plenty of evidence and you're a prosecutor, you are going to be reluctant to try the case because you know it's going to come up against rape myths. And you're concerned primarily about your win-loss record. Now, you may also be concerned about survivors and justice and all of those other topics, but you also have to be concerned about your career. So the whole process is incentivized to not give survivors justice. And if we look at the heart of that, it really has to do with a jury that's steeped in rape myths. You also have you know, survivors coming forward on college campuses and it's not being taken seriously there. The same thing in the military, pick your institution. And I'll point out you know, that, that uh, about 40,000 people are, are raped who are incarcerated each year. So this, it's not just an issue with women. We tend to focus a lot on women as survivors, but our report also goes into the fact that men are uh, survivors of sexual violence as well. And the largest numbers are gonna be in, in the prison industrial complex. It's gonna be incarcerated individuals and they are failed by that system too. Um, I can tell you there's a number on the wall that you can call, but if you call that number, then you're going to be, you know, it, most likely it's guards who are engaging in this behavior or are covering up, see this behavior and are turning a, a, away from it and not doing anything. And so you are the most vulnerable when you're incarcerated and not getting um, any help. And much of this, you know, it has to do with the ways that this simple fact that we don't take rape seriously as a crime and we don't um, we look at survivors as though they are damaged and to blame and we blame them. And I also think, I, I know I'm, this is a long response, but one thing I think that is very powerful is this distancing, right? Why do we blame survivors? Because if I'm not a survivor and somebody got raped and I can attribute their rape to something they did, then as long as I don't do those things, I can prevent rape from happening to me. Um, I think that's a, a really powerful part of the victim blaming. Wow. Yeah, that's a good point. It, you know, just absolutely not the message. The media message is absolutely not what is happening in real life. Um, Dr. Haggard, what, what responsibility do content creators have when it comes to creating media that doesn't perpetuate these harms? And how do we balance, you know, the need for artists to have creative control and also, you know, the desire for more socially just uh, content to be made? Yeah, I think it's a great question because again, it's like, where is this motivation coming from, right? Like, where does your desire to tell a story come from in the first place? And so if you are going to tell a story that's including a rape narrative, 
do your research, first of all, right? I mean, one of my favorite scholars, Linda Williams says, you know, the perpetuation of stereotypes starts from first knowing the historical trajectory of where does this come from? And then the imaginary work that it serves, right? What is the imaginary work that this is serving for us to keep perpetuating these things? And, and obviously it's this very holistic conversation. So as a content creator, first and foremost, why? Why are you telling this story? Why have you chosen this story? What's going on with it? And are you, if you're a television creator, are you doing it like it's the rape episode? So it's this one moment, right? That's not reality. It's this arc of their, you know, as Dr. Esperanza shared, it's this arc of your, it impacts you forever, right? It's not just this one episode and then you get over it. Um, and how are you looking at then what is your, if you are doing it as somebody who's doing it for a social justice reason, then what is the, the aspect of the issue, right? Because it's layered that you really want to hone in on. I remember watching Unbelievable and that Netflix show, and it became so clear to me the number of times she had to retell her story, right? And it was like, oh my God, we make people do that. And it, that, I will never forget that, right? And so that's the power you can have as a content creator too, right? Like, why am I telling this story? And then what is the aspect that I want the audience to really, the fixing that real to real, right? That I really want to hone in on. And I think that can be really powerful. Yeah, thank you. And Dr. Esparza, what is something that the rest of us can do to combat these rape myths? Do you have any um, advice on effective ways to debunk some of them? Ooh, that's really interesting. Um, I think it just comes back to you yourself and kind of your values and your core values. I know that I navigate my world um, with the expressed intent of signaling any a kind of act of dehumanization that I that I witness. And you know, sometimes it might be uncomfortable if you're watching a movie with your brothers or your partner and you see those acts of dehumanization or those rape myths that are so blatant or that uh, rape story that has a really pernicious arc to it, then just point that out, point that out. Just be, be okay with it. Um, the report itself was so uh, striking to me. Um, one of the anecdotes in, in your report, this amazing report is uh, the comedian who um, was talking about rape and how rape jokes can be funny and an uh, audience member said, no, rape jokes are never funny. Uh, I just think that takes so much valor, so much courage. Um, so I would commend that. And then for the rest of us to stand by her side and, and say, yes, that's true. If we are there and somebody speaks out to then become an ally. So um, I think it starts from the individual, from us, from ourselves. And of course, if you are head of an institution, how can you incorporate the debunking of these rape myths into the conversations, uh, into meetings, into um, uh, your curricula, wherever the conversation around sexual violence is met, then that's where we should start to think about this. Because if we don't debunk those rape myths, the disconnection that survivors are going to experience is going to be a huge deterrent to their recovery. And we have to create a world and a society in which they feel that they can disclose what happened to them and there will be compassion and care meeting them and not uh, disbelief and judgment. Thank you, Becca, for that question. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I've got one more question for all of you, but I just wanted to shout to the audience. We've got some cool, some great questions in the Q&A. Um, so definitely send yours in so we can ask our panelists. Um, so my, my last question I wanna ask to all of you. So if you think about, all of the times you've seen rape and sexual violence depicted in media, um, what is one thing that you wish content creators would either stop doing or doing now to um, help reduce harm when it comes to rape myths in, in media? Uh, we can start with you, Dr. Heldman. I would say stop showing the law enforcement and legal system as working. I think if they told the truth about how it doesn't work, we not only obviously wouldn't expect it to work, survivors wouldn't expect that and they wouldn't be like slapped in the face proverbially when they encounter the system, but also um, we would want to change it if we knew how broken it was. So if, they, if content creators, film, TV, if they could just show how broken the system is, I think that's the first step in you know, addressing the problem um, is the first step in addressing it is actually recognizing it and knowing how deeply broken it is. Yeah, thank you. Dr. Haggard? 
I keep coming back to that, like you said, like 90% of, of when they talk to the law enforcement, it like is a positive experience. So it's like, and then you think about law enforcement folks consuming that that content. And so maybe they're feeling like, oh, we're doing the right thing. Or I don't, it's it's this really interesting cycle. So you kind of piggybacking off what you said. I love the action item of like, why don't we start showing other ways besides the criminal justice system that healing and reparations can occur? You know, like what does that look like outside of this system that is so broken? Um, and really mapping that for folks. Um, and then my one big one is always, please, can we just stop with the no, 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 cut to them in the bedroom together? That would be great if we could just end that tomorrow. Thank you so much. Yes. Wild that that's still happening. Yes. Um, and Dr. Esparza, what about you? Uh, yes, I think I'm going to um, follow up with what Dr. Hager just said about um, presenting alternatives to what uh, reparation and healing could, could look like. Um, we do know that survivors tend to go to friends first. They tend to disclose to a friend. And uh, our research shows that if they disclose to a female friend, they tend to have more positive outcomes because the response is more positive. There's less confusion. There's a, a better outcome. Um, so I think that, again, doing their research and presenting that as an alternative. And then we know that when people experience trauma, they are still in this fight or flight response mode. So their cognitive abilities are offline. They're not going to say to themselves, oh, I need help right now. So let me go to a counselor or a therapist. They're not going to do that on their own. They will not do that on their own. And if they do, then they are amazing um, and have a great resilience. But if they disclose to a friend and that friend actually walks them to a counselor, then we start to create a support mm. system and a network of friends, family, and community members that are there for this one person. And then we model what these alternative reparations look like for them. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, all right, so over to the Q&A, we've got some questions in here. The first one is not a question, but Rebecca says, thank you for the presentation and everything you're saying is on point. So thank you, Rebecca. Um, what This question is from Lori Lamont. So any of you who wanna answer this, um, many moons ago, we could report content from TV and movies to an organization called Media Watch. Is there anything like that now? Well, I, there are a number of organizations in this space, right? So, Nicole, you sit at the top of one, CME, uh, CIME, the Center for Intersectionality in Media and Entertainment. And you're doing a lot of watchdog work. The Representation Project is doing a lot of watchdog work. Um, the Gina Davis Institute is doing watchdog work. The Center for the Study of Women in Television and Film. So Dr. Martha Lausen um, at SDSU. There's a diversity report out of UCLA. Um, there is the Annenberg Inclusion Initiative um, out of USC. So there are a number of people who are looking at different pieces of it, um, but nothing that's the equivalent of that organization, unfortunately, anymore. Yeah, did anyone else want to add to that? Okay, there's a question about Baby It's Cold Outside. I know I mentioned that earlier and how about this is an example of adults playing together um, and not necessarily, you know, the idea that coerced women wouldn't sing in harmony with their attackers. And I was wondering if anyone wanted to share their thoughts on that. I hate to jump in again, but this I think is the problem. So on its face, Baby, it's cold outside. The lyrics are rapey, right? So I just want to read some of them. Um, so you have Dean Martin and Doris Day who are singing back and forth. And this is just a snippet. There are many, many other examples in the song that support the obvious claim that it's rapey, right? So Doris Day is saying, but maybe just half a drink more. Dean is saying, put some records on while I pour. Doris, the neighbors might think. Dean, baby, it's bad out there. Doris, say what's in this drink. Like a reference to... Uh, you know, to possibly having a spiked drink. And then Dean says, no cabs to be had out there. So the issue is this on its face, these lyrics are coercive at the very least, right? They're, they're rapey. And yet she's chiming in and singing and going along with it. This is what Dana Title is talking about. This is what our report talks about, where women in the face of sexual violence are not only supposed to accept it, they're supposed to be neutral when they experience violence or are discussing violence, or they're supposed to enjoy it. So I actually think not only is this rapey, um, the point is that she's going along with it, which sends a signal that women everywhere are supposed to go along with it. Mm -hmm. 
or that she didn't know better, right? Like she thought, oh, maybe I didn't want to do it. But then when you cut to the, like gone with the wind is a great example of that, right? When they, he's sexually like violating her. And then the next shot is her bright and cheery face in the morning in bed. Like, I'm so happy he did that to me, right? Similar to what you're talking about with 16 Candles. I mean, this is that narrative that keeps getting pushed on us. That's so problematic and harmful. Yeah. Yeah. And I think also it sets the model for how women feel like they should interact mm. with men. Um, it's like, oh, I, I shouldn't be so overt. I shouldn't just be very clear about my boundaries. It's like, I want to communicate, but also take into account their feelings because I'm loving and caring. No, just be clear about what is it that is important to you? What are your boundaries? Communicate them clearly. And it's okay. And whoever is going to love you is going to love you because of that because you know exactly what you want and how you want to be uh, perceived and, um, you know, cared for. And that's, those are specific messages that young women do receive. Um, so as content creators, as they think about how to portray different scenes, um, I think that there's a really big impact um, in how we expose the male-female dynamics and, and how this negotiation takes place. Mm -hmm. And to follow up with that, at the heart of this is the idea that women don't have agency in sex, right? So if we actually showed women as being more agentic, having more control and power and desire and having their, you know, instead of being sexual objects that are acted upon and are there for our visual pleasure in the male gaze, uh, having women take charge of their, their sexual desires um, in, in scenes and talk about sex. Um, we just don't really see that very often. And also just one more thing on the baby, it's cold outside. Um, the film Love Hard, which it, I love for so many reasons, mostly because it features two male Asian leads uh, in, ro you know, you barely see Asian men in, in romance, you know, as romance leads. And it's got two of them, uh, two, two men um, who are just fantastic. But Love Hard actually takes baby, it's cold outside apart at the end. It critiques it and then offers I would argue better lyrics with more sexual agency for all parties involved. Yeah, I think there's a there's a new baby it's cold outside circulating on social media too that I think it's two lesbians that revamped it. <laughs> and also to build on what what both of you said, you know, the idea that there are ways content creators can combat rape myths and rape culture in media without ever talking about sex or rape too, you know, like the idea mm -hmm. that, that women have agency and showing women and girls drawing boundaries plays into that too. You can, you can say no and it mean no in a kid's show without ever having to talk about um, sexual violence. Um, so this question is a little bit long, but I'm going to read it to y'all. It's a great question from C Christina Meneses. Um, it seems like there's a difference between rape myths that overtly blame survivors and rape myths that make it seem like a survivor's path will be better than it usually is. And that's absolutely true. There's the normalizing of misinformation and then, you know, the actual blaming of survivors. Um, separately, does this research take into account the stance that the audience is supposed to take? For example, showing mm -hmm. that sex workers are blamed more for their own rape can either be showing that this attitude is correct or that if it's not, depending on how the main characters respond. Oh, does anyone have any response that, to that? That's all you, Becca. I mean, as as the person <laughs> who oversaw the research, right? You were yeah. making coding. Christina, this is such a great coding decision. You're yeah. absolutely yes. right. There are two. We very much thought about the rape myths in terms of these two buckets, and also about whether or not do you want to expose how bad it is for sex workers, or by exposing that, are you are you furthering that myth, Becca? Yeah, absolutely. And this comes up, this coding decision comes up when we talk about, you know, tropes and stereotypes in media too, because there's the idea that a woman is weak and that's how she's portrayed as in, as the weak trope um, or the weak stereotype. But then sometimes there's a moment where they use that, the content creators use that in a, in a way that the audience can kind of nod. It's a nod to the audience to show we're um, dismantling and addressing this stereotype that's harmful. In our coding for this project, we only, like um, Dr. Heldman mentioned, we only um, considered rape myths that were be per being perpetuated without any sort of nuance. Um, and so, and there were very few examples of rape myths that were, you know, brought up and then addressed in the top media. I know that there are other, there's other content, and this is a question for y'all too. Um, have you, have any of you seen or know of any content that is doing it right, that is, is, you know, using rape myths as a way to teach rape myths? So Nicole, you pointed out 
unbelievable just yeah. you went back and forth on are you kidding that this is how many times you have to tell your story and I don't think people really get that right they don't get how awful it is and re-traumatizing it is to tell your story again and again and again um, but there have been a number of um I would argue TV shows and films. I mean, I, I may destroy you promising young woman, women talking. They're all of these recent shows and films that have more nuanced representations. Yeah. Um, and some of them like put up the myth and then debunk it. Um, some of them just avoid the myths altogether. I think both are effective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one other question about the research that I'll address real quick. This is from Danielle Slack Slackoff. Uh, first, thank you all for so much for your work. I do media and crime research as well, and I'm grateful to see this work in such an impactful space. So thank you for that work. Um, and the question is, did we look at differences across race of the victim and how rape myths were portrayed across media? Um, and then she said, in my own work, I found black slash Latina victims are portrayed much less favor favorably than white victims in crime news, a different medium I know. Um, and just to respond to this real quick, we did, we tried to, our unit of analysis for this research project was actually the incident, so the, the event of rape or sexual violence. Um, so we weren't capturing as much uh, information about the survivors and the perpetrators as we would have wanted to, um, but in the interest of, you know, casting a wider net and, and looking at more content, we made that decision. Um, we did find kind of, you know, qualitatively, and there was some numbers to back this up, that in general, the only survivors that are being depicted are thin, white, um, cisgender, uh, straight women, usually upper class, right? We're seeing one kind of depiction of what a survivor can look like. And this mirrors what we see in news media too, in terms mm -hmm. of whose survivors stories are um, are being told. And I know that that's, a, that's more complicated than I'm uh, bringing up. So, oh, and the other thing I wanted to mention too, is that there are so few examples of, of women of color as survivors in these, um, in the content that we looked at, mainly because women of color are underrepresented, um, period, in media. But when we have numbers that are so small, it's hard to really get good data on how, you know, how these rape myths are, are affecting women um, based on their different intersecting identities. But Caroline, did you want to speak to some of that nuance? Yeah. So as Becca is pointing out, um, there is a vast underrepresentation of women of color in media content in general. And so then when you go that extra layer down and you're looking specifically at crime related TV shows and then another layer down looking at incidents, um, we just didn't have the numbers to do what we would consider to be a scientific comparison across racial groups. And that is a function of the fact that women of color are mostly erased. Um, I will say we didn't find differences um, given our small numbers. With that said, when in the essentially the literature review for the report, we do cite these studies, right, that Black and Latin victims are um, viewed much more favor or much less favorably than white victims uh, in crime news. We also look at biases and rape myths in crime news, and we look at the various, um, the, the intersections of experiences of sexual violence. So women of color face higher rates of sexual violence than white women, uh, but especially Native American women, uh, Latin and and black women. Uh, we also see that um, transgender women face much higher rates of sexual violence. Uh, we really unpack a lot of this in, in our literature review because uh, sexual violence, like most you know, types of, of crimes or, or uh, social justice related, or uh, I would, would say crimes that reflect hierarchy and oppression, um, this particular crime disproportionately affects marginalized groups in profound ways. Thank you for adding that on. We've got time for about two more questions. And I know there's a lot more in this chat, but please, if we don't get to yours, feel free to follow up. Um, and again, this will be recorded and put up on our uh, website along with our other end rape campaign components, which, so that's all of our expert interviews from the past year, our report, our fact sheet on rape myths, and also a link to Dana Title's um, art exhibit that Caroline mentioned earlier. Um, so this question is from Jen Frankel. A, a cop once told me, sometimes a knife is just his way of telling you it's over when a boyfriend threatened me with a weapon. I'm a writer and a creator, and I've always pledged to represent the way things are and the way I wish they could be. My question is about statistics on men taking action, uh, talking action and speaking out against other men. Are there stats on men being uh, proactive when it comes to taking on sexual violence? And have you looked at men's complicity in your work? I imagine that is about the rep project in this report, but I would be interested to hear um, any of your takes on that. Dr. Nicole? 
<laughs> That's all you, Dr. Albin. <laughs> so, um, so I will say we don't have data on men's complicity or lack of pro lack of action around these issues. Um, I will say that there are a number of prominent men who, like Dr. Jackson Katz and Ashanti Branch, uh, a lot of men who join the fight, a call to men who are very actively trying to get men uh, more involved in preventing sexual violence uh, because you know men's men are the primary perpetrators of violence. Um, other men are the primary victims of most forms of violence. The exception would be right sexual violence. Um, that that women are the primary um, objects of sexual violence, mostly at the hands of men. And so uh, when you look at this, it, it behooves men to be talking to other men about addressing restrictive traditional masculinity that not just accepts violence, various forms of violence, um, but also promotes it as a way to prove your manhood. Um, and we know that this is class and we know that this is race and we know that this is gendered. So um, all of this to say, it has been, uh, there aren't many men doing it, but the few who are, uh, we, we commend them. Um, we did run a campaign a few years ago called Ask More of Him, hashtag Ask More of Him, and Justin Baldoni and a number of other luminary celebrities, David Schwimmer, uh, signed a letter calling for men to do more to you know, address uh, inequalities, gender inequality, and, and specifically address uh, gender violence, gender-based violence in our culture. And so there are a lot of good men um, who you know, are, are using their voice. I wish there were more because if you if you look at a problem, right, we're not going to address racism without actually getting a whole lot of white folks involved. Mm -hmm. We're not going to address patriarchy and sexism without getting a whole lot of men involved. I think the other piece that's really interesting for men, and especially when we're talking about like the intersection of race and gender, is the way in which particularly the myth of the black rapist, but then we also see it as like the myth of the Latino rapist and all of the, you know, discussion about the, like this idea that there's this looming rapist out there and we must protect our women is used in politics so much. And that's not about rape, right? Like that's not actually about, because we care so much about women being raped because if we cared about so much about women being raped and bringing this to justice, all of these stats wouldn't be a thing, right? So and so I I wrote a whole piece on like the history of the representation of like the brutal black buck and the myth of the rap, black rapist and how this operates. So I'm fascinated by that side of it too, right? And, and it's all wrapped up into this idea that we don't actually care about rape, like you were saying in the very beginning. And how does the, the media sort of create that culture as well? Um, that's fascinating to me too. Yeah, rape is a tool of power. Yeah. It really is. Um, and whether regardless of who who the survivor the victim is it is is a tool of of power and you see it used in very ra weaponized and very racialized ways and in very mm -hmm. general ways yeah and what we found too you know in looking at like the taboo subject of talking about porn it shouldn't be taboo mm. we now know the very negative effects of turning over sexual education two generations of sex education to pornographers who have a an addiction model so what you have is, you know, more violence, more degradation. Um, and we talk quite a bit about the sexualization and degradation of black women, for example, or Latin women uh, in the border porn series. And I, it, it, it's disgusting that we are using these existing power structures and eroticizing the subordination, degradation and violence against women of color in this way. Um, also, we find though that black and Latin men in porn are more likely to be shown as the aggressors of sexual violence. So it, it's not just happening in kind of mainstream media, it's also happening in porn, which is consumed actually more than mainstream media. So the way in which we uh, classify mainstream entertainment, I, I wish we thought more about porn mm. as being something that a whole lot of people are getting some very, very disturbing messages from. Yeah. Yeah, Those the numbers in the report on that were staggering. Um, this individual, Trevor Williams, um, posted a question. I think it's just sharing some information that there's a study from the U of C in Calgary, Canada, highlighting men's experiences of being abused and I um, and, and, and how to engage them in this work. I am not able to share in the chat. I don't know why I can't share to everybody, but we'll figure out a way to share this link. One last question from an anonymous attendee. Um, 
So the question here, are there other reports that are being worked on to recognize and discuss other harmful tropes that are present in media, like the women in the woman in the refrigerator trope, for example? Um, and, you know, first off, just a plug for all of our other research that, you know, the Rep Project has um, has put out many incredible reports over the last few years looking at um, tropes and stereotypes for women um, of all marginalized identities, um, looking at, you know, representation in the Super Bowl ads, in the Olympics, in um, the Oscars and the Emmys. And I know that uh, Dr. Haggard, your organization has put out work too. There's there's so, uh, so much out there. Um, a good place to start, I think, would be the State of Media Summit report, which um, kind of compiles all of it together and gets you at least um, thinking about the different orgs that are putting out this work. Um, so my question for all of you is, what is something, you know, Dr. Esparza, you mentioned that we need to educate ourselves and speak up. Um, what are, how can we educate ourselves on media literacy and tropes and stereotypes and rape myths um, so that we can better call them out when we see them? besides I'm reading sorry. all our reports. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Dr. Esparza. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, Becca, uh, you broke up a little bit. Um, so I didn't know if the question was directed at me. Oh. Um, yes, um, absolutely. This report is amazing. I think that having these conversations and Trevor Williams sharing that link with us, um, I also see a few comments around um, people's experiences like teaching at film schools and how um, rape was used as, a, as the inciting incident in some of these projects, um, just really bringing to light how normalized these um, myths are and how normalized the degradation of women in all kinds of spheres is, uh, is something that people use strategically in their work um, and calling attention to it. Just like Dr. Hawker said, like, why are you doing this? What's the intent? What's the purpose and um, being able to speak to that? Uh, I think those are key questions to ask. It's making me think of um, the question earlier about like, you know, common sense media or it wasn't come, one of the, you know, like the media watchdog things. I think what we're seeing a lot right now is this, when there are organizations that are working on a particular social justice issue, now they're going to a lot of the organizations like Caroline mentioned, like Rep Project or CME or, you know, Annenberg, all these places and being like, hey, what do you know? about this issue. And I so I think we're having this really, we're at this moment where we're recognizing the power for social justice um, issues and, and then the media's impact on them. And so we're getting these really niche reports, right, about these fascinating topics. And what's so cool about this one in particular is, you know, Dana's documentary where she goes through like different movies and how they are perpetuating for her, what does she call it, Caroline? It's not like the rape myth, but it's consent culture, really, right? Like, how does that get, you know, all of these scenes, like in Gone with the Wind and 16 Candles and all that, you know, how does this lead to this idea of this is just the way things are and and how, how did we end up here in the first place, right? It's really powerful. But then this data is like breaking down what's going on in the social, the criminal justice system, these very particular things that happen when a rape has actually happened on screen, right? And so both of those things in tandem are, are fascinating. And so I think that's what, you know, if you are wanting to educate yourself more, those are two really great paths to go down and to see, okay, what is the moment when I'm watching this that's making me like, ugh, right? Like pay attention to yourself. What is that moment that happens for you? Which one of these myths was like hitting you the hardest? And then that's a clue for you of the path you can go down more to learn more about it. Um, and that's what I would do. That's great advice. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Haggard. And thank you to all of our panelists. I know we're out of time, um, but just a truly an honor to have this conversation with you, three incredible academic activists. Um, and your work is phenomenal and you are all mentors and um, role models for me and I appreciate everything you do. Um, and one more shameless plug for the report in this campaign. Um, the report you can find on our website under the research section in the campaign, which is called the End Rape Campaign, is happening on social media and on our website too. Um, we also put out a celebrity PSA video that shows some of the egregious comments made about survivors that perpetuate rape myths in the courtroom. And so I highly recommend watching that. Um, and please share the report and the video to everyone that you think would be be interested in um, that work. Uh, and yeah, thank you so much for being here and for all your thoughtful questions. Uh, and everybody, please have a wonderful holiday season. Thanks again to the panelists.
Thank you, Becca. Thanks, Becca. Bye. You're amazing. Thank you, Becca. Amazing.